I come from a community. I was over a thousand years, six thousand years old. We never moved. We're not nomads. We are there in our community and survive. Right now, while I'm speaking, the sun is getting higher and higher. My father would say to me, son, prepare yourself because there's food coming. Prepare your cab so you can store your food away. Prepare your equipment so you can feed your community. Prepare your way of life so you won't lose it. If there's any oil activity in my area, I'll lose my way of life, I'll lose my language, I'll lose my culture, and I'll lose my celebration of the animals. My people have good stories, and I'm glad you get to listen to it. Tomorrow, we are going to department heads, like Mineral Management Service, that go out and do offshore leasing. Like in my area, February 6, 2006 was a bad year. My people were sad because oil development was coming to our area. We have a history that talk about climate change. We have a history that talk about oil development. And those sisters are coming to reality. In the ending of the film, you notice that Shell Oil is going to do activity in 2009. When we were fighting this very important issue, my own people, my own political people, told me, you're crazy, Earl. You're not going to win the case. You're not going to stop world development. You are crazy. Why are you doing this? The reason I'm doing it is because I don't want to lose my way of life. I don't want to lose my culture. I don't want to lose my identity. And I don't want to lose my people. I come from the village of Noxit. We're 60 miles away from Prudhoe Bay. And when you look at some of the maps that I have to use in our discussions, just as there's countries with blocks and cement, well, we have blocks in our area. They're blocks of land that have been sold to oil companies. For miles and miles, to the east of us, to the south of us, to the west of us, to the north of us, we have blocks that are colored red because they're sold for oil and gas leasing. I started this process because I became a community health aide in our village. In our village, when I moved there in 1986, we had 323 people. But only one person out of all those people used an inhaler to help them breathe. I was taught a standard of care. I was taught a physical exam. I was taught what's normal and what's not. Wheezes are not normal. I rarely heard it, just in the one patient when I first got there. I decided to further my education and go to the University of Washington and become a physician assistant. I went in 89 and came back in 91. It only took 21 months to go through that program. But when I came back, there was 35 people using medications to help them breathe. I started going to our local community meetings and I was asking questions. What's going on? Why are things changing? There are common things such as people that smoke. We have a long history of TB. We have other factors that are affecting us. But even in houses that had been smoke free, we were still having people get sick. I took our village map and I started putting dots on all the houses. I started looking at people that were having to use medicines to help them breathe. I started putting marks down for houses that had smokers. I started putting other factors down. 
And I saw on our map, it didn't matter where they lived. It didn't matter if they were smokers or not. It didn't matter. Because we were having people in every house have trouble with breathing. I continued asking questions, but things continued to get worse. One of the things that I could see were the natural gas flares that used to be 60 miles away were getting closer. On nights when we had lots of those flares going on, about 11 o'clock at night when it gets to be 20 below, one person would call, they're having trouble breathing. I'd go to the clinic and I'd help them. It takes about an hour to call the doctor, give the treatment, do all the things that we needed to do. Before I was done, somebody else would come in. They're having trouble also. But the problem with our state is we have blanket exemptions to exceed those air quality standards. Also during the permitting process, they designed the initial permits to be with inside those standards that are not even protecting us. But they piecemeal the development. They put a small part out, and then they throw all these other pieces out there. And they not only do it with that site, but all these other sites. So you're constantly, constantly trying to deal with this battle of papers of what they're planning to do. But there's no science behind it until the Exxon Valdez. With that spill, we had people from that area develop their own science, their own data about what really happened. We have people all around us that are getting sick. This certificate that I wear is from my auntie. She died of cancer. The my parka that I wear is from my, from my cousin. She died of cancer. I have other pieces of garments from other relatives that have died from cancer. It gives me strength, but it's also painful to share these stories. Those particles that are emitted into the air, into the water, into our environment, they get into our food, they get into our bodies, they get into our future generations when our women are carrying them. We have to talk about the importance of this process. We have to talk about the things our grandparents taught us and how it's important. We have to talk about the importance of what our parents taught us, of the areas that we're living in, and how it's important how we're using these areas. How we want to use these areas ourselves and how we want to use these areas with our children. We have to talk about how important our health is and how we're concerned about changes to people's health that are being affected with things that are changing with the efforts to develop the resources. My village was the first village corporation to get an oil and gas development on tribal lands. They thought it was a great thing, and yeah, some of them are getting some big dividends. But our tribal council passed a resolution in opposition to offshore. Not just in the Beaufort where we live, in the Chukchi where Earl lives, in Bristol Bay, and in Cook Inlet. Our municipal government is pushing a resolution to develop a moratorium to oppose offshore development in the Beaufort and the Chuck Chi. People say, oh, you live in Alaska? How can you even try? Because when I look in those new babies' eyes, that's who we're working for. When I deal with those people that have gotten sick and they can't do it themselves, that's who we're here for. For those elders that have gone on before us and carried this fight for the years before we were here, that's who we're doing this for. And even though many have told me we would never succeed as they have told Earl, we are succeeding and we will continue to succeed. I have hope that not all my grandchildren and my great grandchildren will have to use inhalers. And I thank you for coming and learning to participate and willing to travel to come here. It took us over 2,000 miles to get here. I don't know how far it took you all, but I know it took a lot. And your families have to go without you while you're doing this. You have to separate to go to your education, but you're going to bring a lot with you. And take it with strength and determination and make the change. Thank you.